So, since I come from the system side, I've been listening to physics all morning. It's been great. I haven't heard that much in 20 years, as I heard this morning. It's been uh, quite nice to hear all about the great innovations that's happening on the material side. But from a system point of view, I like to come back to the journey we have made in my business, the telecommunication business, for the last 30 years. It's been an amazing ride, and I think many of you have experienced this. So just a short recap, what have we had? Well, since the days of GSM 1990, we are now deploying 5G, and many of you, you are using 5G on a daily basis, I'm sure. And we have been able to increase the bit rate by one the data speed, I should say, by one million, a factor of one million. It's been a tremendous journey. Roughly there is 100 difference between each generation. So each generation, when you go from 1G to 2G to 3 to 4G, you increase by 100 times the data rate. And if you sum everything up, we're about at 1 million right now. Back in the GSM days, you remember, we had a data speed of about, or a bit rate, 10 kilobit per second. And now we are beyond one gigabit, approaching 10 gigabits. So it's an amazing ride. Now for us as a company, what does this mean? It means that we have a lot of challenges to combat in order to make this work. And how does it relate to material science? Well, that is the foundation for the basis for being able to do all the compute we need to do today in our systems in order to make them work. And the problem is that we are facing an exponential growth. This is really getting a key challenge for us to evolve these systems. As you see here in this graph, if we take LTE as an example, this is 4G LTE. When we launched this some 10 years ago, we um, had roughly 10 megahertz of bandwidth. We have two transmit, two receive chains in a base station, and you had a transmission time interval of one millisecond. That means that you had one millisecond to do your compute in order to do the link adaptation, correct your modulation format, do what's ever needed to get the link budget in place. If we now look at what's happened 10 years in time, we are approaching these systems today where in a 5G system we would have 100 megahertz of bandwidth. You would typically have 64 transmit, 64 receive systems in your base stations, and we have reduced the, trans the uh, transmission time interval to half a millisecond due to latency requirements. We need the system to be very responsive. So if you sum this up, you realize that during these 10 years, we must do 160 more computes half the time. That's basically what it means. You increase the chains, transceive, transmit chains by 32, and you increase the bandwidth five times, roughly 160 times more compute you need to do, and you have half the time to do this. How do you do that? Typically, you rely on Moore's law. That's what we have been doing for several, several years. We rely on that the speed of the technology just gets faster and faster, and we can piggyback on that. No problem. The problem is that Moore's law is getting harder and harder to follow. We need more semiconductor innovations combined with architectural innovations in order to keep up with this pace, the demands that are being put on our systems. So that is the message that we are not on a plateau and we say that ah, now we are in deep sub-micron and nanometer technology, it's all good. This journey will continue. And even if we may not need the speed all the time, we need to lower the power consumption. So these two different dimensions will interplay and there will for sure be needs to improve the performance of our systems going forward. So if we then zoom in on what we face in hardware development. I'm here to talk about pilot lines, why do we need pilot lines, and the importance of those. And my key message is really that it takes a very long time to produce a hardware system. It's not something that you will do in a year or so. Typically in our business, from the first days you look into research, you start working on a 
let's say, a research project with academia, it can be up to 10 years before you see those ideas materialize into products. And I tried to go through this journey together with you, where the blue color here indicates the research phase. It's quite stretched in time. The effort is limited, but it paves the way for the product development. And it's really essential in order for the product development to be competitive in the end. So the first phase is external collaboration. This is really why a business like mine, uh, we are very keen on working together with academia, be part of joint collaboration activities. And it's not because we're looking for the next product. We're looking to find the golden nuggets or the right pieces in this pile of stones, as you see here. Because it might be that we don't really know exactly what we're looking for, but we would like to know where science is heading. Because we're in a competitive field, and if we don't find the right stone, someone else will. And then, bad for us. So we need to work on a broad scale, and we need to work with clever minds. That's the first step. And this happens typically, see here, up to eight years before we have an, even have a product launch. So very early on. Then, hopefully, you find some interesting pieces that you would like to pursue. In this case, illustrated with some raw diamonds here. You find some concepts that you think are interesting enough. So you ramp up your internal resources. This is where our dedicated departments, I belong to Ericsson Research, typically my department would try to see where are the real promising ideas that stem from academia, from these external collaborations. And then we try to uh, put some pressure on those, really see, can they fail? Can we make them fail? Is it, I mean, what they, because it's very selling, right? Academia would say, this is great. It's, it's the best we've ever seen. And our job is really to put some doubts and say that, yeah, you tell us this, but will it work? What happens if we do this? What happens if we do that? We really try to scrutinize it a bit and see, okay, what can actually fly? And when we have identified the right stones, then it's time to go more into the commercial phase. And this is where you would enter trials, ecosystem engagement, standardization, really, really preparing for product development. But this happens quite many years after the initial innovations that you have had in academia. So that is important to keep in mind. It takes quite some time. But this is the, maybe the most critical phase also in the development, because this is where you will combat existing technologies. This is where we will face a lot of resistance from already existing, uh, let's say, uh, legacy activities you have had, both on, on the commercial side, but also from competitive research, maybe, that would claim that ah, it, it's promising, but this is better, etc., etc. So this is a crucial phase, because it's really the doorstep to product development. And once you go into product development, we are now shaping the diamond ring here, so it's about to make these promising gems into something really beautiful and something you can sell, etc. Then it's too late to do research, of course. Then you should really have a concept that flies, and it's, it's about making products in the end. And then this is nothing that normally, I mean, academia would care about too much, but of course it's essential for our business, because this is where you make money in the end. And the final piece here, which I think was also mentioned this morning by the CEO of Alfa Laval, it, it is really important to keep in mind, you must be able to produce this. Research is great, but if it's only a lab experiment, mm, it, it's tough to commercialize. You must be able to put it up in volumes. You must have an idea how it can scale up. And this is also something that we will, of course, have in mind very early on in the exploration phase when we try to scrutinize ideas. Can we have volumes of this? It, will it be a cheap technology? Is it something that will be production viable down the road? It's going to be really important. But this is typically the journey we have. And, and as you see, we are engaged already here. So we, we are not only here at the university because we think it's fun. It's actually a crucial part of our product development, but at a very early phase. So I wanted to give you a few examples of activities that we have had over the years where we have seen the 
importance of having early exploration and early trials. So you all know about 5G, I'm sure, but you also know that 5G in Sweden is launched in the lower gigahertz frequencies. We don't have millimeter wave deployments yet here. So these first 5G systems, that, then this system that is depicted on this slide is actually from the US market where the first application was how can we make the last mile deployment cheap. So in this case we have Verizon, a huge uh, US operator. They came to us and say we would like to have a wireless connection, connectivity solution, fiber replacement. So we can reach out to a neighborhood without having individual fibers, but having a radio link instead. And then this was the first phase of 5G, you might say, where we used millimeter wave frequencies to get the bandwidth, because there you need to go up in order to have enough bandwidth for these systems. And uh, what you see here is a Bicema silicon germanium radio that was co-developed together with IBM, actually Ericsson IBM design, that started already 2014. We started this design. Prior to that, we had studies on this, of course, and right now, 2023, we are shipping these products to customers in North America and other markets. So you see the lead time here. We're talking about from the first ASICs we produced till the products we are shipping today, it's almost 10 years. So we must keep this time span in mind that it takes a long time to do this productization. If you're a bit curious about the system, I can say a few words. You see here, we have 32 TRX chains, so 32 transmit, receive. And uh, the module here that this chip would go into, you see the module up here, you have, you have four of them on, on each PAM, as it's called, phased array module. Um, each such piece here would then go into four of these. So, so you have an antenna array, as this is called. So it's an antenna array, so you have 64 antennas in each array. You see 10 by 10 because also you have a dummy row. On the outside it's not connected, it's just dummies. But you have 8 by 8 active antennas. And when you connect all these four antenna arrays into this base station, then you have 512 antenna ports. It's cross-polarized, so that's why you get 512 and not 256. And each antenna port has its own radio change. You realize that these systems are rather complex. You run a lot of signals in parallel. Now this is an analog beamforming system, so you point your energy in a specific direction. So it's very analog. But what we now see in the crystal ball going forward is that we will move into digital systems. It's called MIMO, Massive Input, Massive Output Systems. Then you would have compute associated with each antenna port. And when you have these big arrays, that sums up to a lot of computational power happening in the base station. And that is what is driving this exponential curve that I was showing earlier. So this is one example from the Bicemos world. If we then go for another example coming from the CMOS world, in this case SOI, so silicon on insulator, uh, these activities started many years ago, where back in 2016, here in Lund, we looked into some initial designs targeting millimeter wave, where we used silicon, ordinary commercial silicon. That was an ST platform, 28 nanometer. And um, we wanted to do early experiments, really try to understand what are the limitations, how much output power can we get, uh, what kind of integration would be possible, etc. And then we have refined this. So you see the journey we have made here with different ASICs. We have tried out different things going for, we have looked into digital interconnect, which is extremely important because it's very power hungry. When you connect one ASIC to another ASIC, for instance, an RF ASIC, analog RF ASIC, to a digital baseband ASIC, you need to ship a lot of bits in between. That consumes a lot of energy. So the digital interconnect is one of the limiting factors today in order to scale up these systems. So we looked at that in, with a dedicated ASIC just to investigate. We have also looked into what happens if we scale up. So instead of having just a few transmit-receive chains, we went to 32-32. So 
we, we really wanted to look into the complexity, what happens with signal integrity, stuff like that, when we put all these on the same die. So we looked into that. Then we have followed up by, what about the output power? How can we boost efficiency with our PA? This is actually, I don't know how much circuit design you, you have come across, but this is a door to PA, meaning actually you have two PAs basically where one main PA takes care of the lower power range and then you add on an auxiliary PA in order to preserve the efficiency across the full, let's say, output power range. But in order to do that in an efficient way, you need to have adaptive biasing. You need to have some clever way of bias the circuits. And this is what we looked into over here. And you see here that we do a lot of exploration, but we don't really see products for quite many years. I see a market window maybe a few years from now. Uh, and we see also the ecosystem where vendors are also targeting having CMOS, SOI, CMOS related products in this time frame. But this is more than 10 years after we actually started the work and academia started even earlier. So you see the need here for the pilot lines. We're coming back to the pilot lines now. Why do we in industry need to have access to technology almost a decade in advance? It's because it takes such a long time. Um, why does it take a long time? Because you need to develop architectures that might be specific for a certain technology or a certain performance capability of a technology. So it's really important to have these pilot lines in place. And I must say that now with the CHIPS Act joint undertake, it's a great initiative. I really welcome this. Um, I think it's really good now that Sweden is on the boat, uh, in the boat, I should say. We, it's not like the IPSI program where we decided to stay out. We are a key player here. We should take full advantage of that. It's really important. But I also want to point out that we see all of these nice slides and there are errors back and forth and everything should work out perfectly. There are pitfalls. Uh, coming back to this picture, I really hope that when we initiate these pilot lines, we, my hope and what we try to tell the Commission and the, uh, and the European environment about this is that we need to make it really lean for industry to engage in. This is not the let's say, a uh, semiconductor physics endeavor for the sakes of physics. We need to use this pilot line in the right context. And in order to do that, we need to remember that we as a system house, Ericsson in this case, but many of our peer uh, companies out there in the business, we cannot fix the technology. We are technology users. We can never be a PDK debugging activity. That has to be taken care of by people or experts in the field. You guys, being in the physics side, working on technologies, PDK here, that is basically the design kit, the tools we use in order to design circuits, how we model transistors, how we model imperfections and the electromagnetics in a good way. There we need help. We from the system side cannot dissolve this, but if we engage in a too immature technology, we will end up in this trap. We need to avoid that. We must also make technology viable for industry to use, meaning easy way into the pilot lines where it's not commercial, where we can tape out in, do small chips, trials together with academia uh, at a quite affordable price because we need to do a lot of experiments. So I think that's also going to be key. And I think some of this can actually be done in the facilities that are being initiated now across Europe. We will have an excellent facility here in Lund, we already have. There will be other initiatives around Europe as part of these pilot lines. If we can have quality in those facilities and really make those also accessible for the, for the industry to play, I think that could be, that, that is really, really good. It should not be a commercial thing early on. It has to be in the research, spirit of research. And then as you see, as we traverse here to the right hand side, it's all about maturity. It's about having the yield. It's about having stability. It's because we're reaching the product development phase. So, and this will of course happen naturally. Um, but 
the punchline here at the bottom is something that I want you to take with you as well. And that is how do we solve, I mean, me representing the system side, I would like to design today for something that will become business viable 10 years from now. And I have your technology to play with. But is that the right technology 10 years from now? Or will you, have, will you have invented something else during that time that might tap into and change my reality? And how can I make sure that I develop the right architecture given what you provide me with today in order to be competitive 10 years from now? How should we work together, industry, academia, in order to do that? Because if I bet on the wrong horse, I'm out of business 10 years from now. Well, maybe not out of business, but I will be in deep trouble because there will be competition, which can be more having higher performance. So it's all about understanding what different technology options do we have? What kind of pros and cons do we have? Because changing the technology during this 10 year journey is very costly, both in resources and time and money and everything. We don't want to do that. You don't want to pursue a silicon germanium track and realize in the fifth tape out that, oh, we should have went to this technology instead and now we have to redo everything. No good. We have to realize that early on. The interplay between academia, industry, in this ecosystem is going to be very important for that. And as you know, final slide here, my side. What is 16? You have heard it many times, I guess. It's uh, really a bus right now. Uh, this is the Ericsson story. To us, 60 is, of course, a continuation of 5G. But if you think about the Gs we've had in the past, you start to see a pattern. You start to realize that the first G, when you move into a new G, what happens typically is that, let's say 3G, when we lost 3G, we thought that now video call will be the big thing. Ericsson thought that video call will revolutionize the world. That was the killer app. It was a complete failure, it turned out to be. It was first in 4G. We, we noticed that these kind of applications really took off. 3G was an enterprise solution, more or less. It served good on the commercial side, the business side. But 4G was when the private market used the technology to a larger extent that we already developed in 3G. 5G that we launched today it's also very much on the enterprise side. You see connected factory floors, you see connected robots, all kinds of expensive equipment being connected because that's where you have the cost viability. You can afford to take the initial hit. What 6G will do, according to us, it will basically take 5G to the private market where you will connect everything you have in your homes, everything that's around you, and we will have the fully connected society. It will be on the same trajectory as 5G, but it will happen in the time span of 6G. Right now, and we, so we see this pattern repeating itself. So when I present this slide here about 6G, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is really the evolution of 5G, but for you guys, for everyone here, I mean the private market. And we see a lot of initiatives already today around the world. We have all the great sponsors here, national sponsors, Horizon Europe, we now we heard about the pilot line, chips you under, undertake, all that would happen. We have Iron in Japan, we have Next in the US, we have National Science Foundation, we have the Chinese initiative. Everyone is going into this race. And if we look into the timeline, I've just listed here on this slide a few activities that will happen. But we can probably expect some pre-commercial systems to show up here and we will have some kind of commercial launch, I would say, by the end of this decade. That is how it looks right now. But of course it is in the end a continuous journey. It's not going to be, let's say, a complete leapfrog. It will be a continuous journey now with 5G moving gradually into 6G. But let's remember pilot lines, so important. You lay the foundation for this technology. You decide or determine, I should say, how much compute we will be able to have, what kind of radio capability we, will, we, can, we can deploy in the end. And the final thing here, now I've been talking a lot about chips. We should remember that chips is not 
the only part of the system. It's actually how we connect chips into the same package, into the same module, on the same board, that would probably make the difference in the end. No technology is best at everything. We need to combine different technologies, and we combine that into a system. So to me, Chipsact is as much about heterogeneous integration, package design, and system integration as it is just looking into the single die and semiconductors. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick, for a great talk. And uh, I think a key message here is the long timeline, the 10-year timeline for, from uh, research until product development, and that the pilot line must be able to sustain technology over this long uh, period of time. I think we have time for, for one or two questions here. Thanks for the, the interesting talk, and uh, thanks also for the examples. Well, what I would like to uh, ask is, uh, what if there were pilot lines available uh, 10 years ago? How would uh, the development of these, uh, these example uh, products have, uh, have changed? So if we look into the uh, CMOS journey I showed, the SOI technology, that that's actually is a pilot line. It's under the uh, Horizon framework. It's uh, been driven by global founders and ST Microelectronics in Europe for quite many years. And we started this activity connecting to the pilot lines. So, and we are in that race still today. So the 20 nanometer example and the 22 nanometer example I presented, they are actually part of the existing private uh, pilot line landscape and we're utilizing that and many of the chips we did that did there we we actually did in collaboration activities with uh, external partners uh, so for sure i mean we have had pilot lines over the years and and we will continue to have that and i think it's a really important instrument in order for europe to stay competitive um, my experience with the existing pilot lines uh, take the soi example is that in, in the very beginning, they were very, let's say, immature, meaning that it required a lot of effort on our side in order to actually produce anything we could understand or make sense of from our circuit design perspective. So we have worked a lot with the engineering teams, both with ST and Global Founders, in order for them to sort of make models that we can use, etc. We provide a lot of feedback. And this interaction is, of course, exactly what the foundry ecosystem is looking for. They want, I mean, to want us to provide that feedback, and that is all good. But I'd just like to stress that it also slows down a little bit the, uh, the activities on our side. So we need to have more let's say, players who understands modeling, understands how the circuit design or the physics behind the circuit design to a larger degree. I hope we can fix that with a new chip joint undertake going forward. So it's not only on the system side to sort of try to provide this feedback, but we can have more players, more startups, more people being involved early on and that we can get more support because it consumes a lot of effort. Thank you. Uh, so I have a following question uh, because you talked about uh, the early technology exploration. So as a company, how early do you start exploring? I mean, the, my question is, do you start looking already at the fundamental research or you, you, you wait uh, till applied research appears? I mean, so how deep you, you yeah, start? I would say we, we don't go with the fundamental research. There we rely on universities and, and the public domain to a large degree and RTOs to do that for us. We simply cannot afford to do that. But so I would say we engage when the applied research kicks in. Uh, that would be my short answer. Yes. Okay, thanks but a lot. The fundamental research is vital to safeguard Europe for the next 10 years. <laughs> I would agree that fundamental research is vital for our ecosystem, but it's not really the role of us as a commercial business to maybe engage or sponsor the fundamental research. It's a, it's a, it's a challenge for the society, I should say. So, uh, no, 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 we, d we follow, but we don't necessarily have the capabilities to engage ourselves but we definitely follow what's happening 
Thanks a lot, Frederick. Thank you.